Turn with me this morning, please, to the book of James chapter 1. And I asked your pastor, Pastor Jerry, I said, hey, uh, you know, this really is really a two-part message. And uh, I don't know who's teaching on Wednesday night, if you can give them a little bump, and maybe I can teach in their stead. And Jerry said, oh, I'm teaching Wednesday, so you could take my spots. So I said, oh, thank you so much, Jerry. So uh, I want to invite you to really come back on Wednesday night because uh, really there's a part two to this message and I'm looking forward to sharing the word with you also on Wednesday night. But I think it all depends on how good I do this morning if you're going to come back Wednesday, huh? So, whoo, the pressure's on. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But no, it's really a joy just to be able to share the word and, and just be back with you. And, you know, things change. God just does new things. God does new things in our family and in our life and, you know, in the church family here and God's doing a great work in our church family together in Japan and just all over the world as God is just pouring out his spirit. So I pray that you'd be encouraged this morning just to serve Jesus and follow him with all your hearts. As we look at this portion of scripture together, we'll be in James chapter 1 verses 1 through 11 only together today. And as we study this portion, we see that James will encourage us to rejoice in your trials. Yes, listen to that again. James will encourage us to rejoice in your trials, live by faith, and don't trust in money because it fades away so fast. Well, what's the purpose? There needs to be a reason why we're gathering, not just for a Bible study, not just for that, but for us to really grasp hold of something and take it with us. I pray that we would be encouraged to rejoice and put our full trust in Jesus Christ. Again, that we would rejoice and that we would put our full trust in Jesus Christ. Would you pass up a million dollars? Let me say that again. Would you pass up a million dollars? Well, I read this article interesting this week, very interesting article. Maybe you've been following along with it on the things that are happening in Greece right now and with the bailout and the things that they're experiencing financially. It tells us this in the article, Greeks spend in droves afraid of losing savings to a bailout. This is in Maurici, Greece. Business has been so brisk in the giant Koltsolovos Appliance and Electronics Store, which is, I guess, similar to our Best Buy that we have here in Southern California, but this is their Best Buy, in this upper middle class suburb of Athens, that you might think that a major Christmas sale is going on. But no, it's a panic buying. Those who work here say, increasingly concerned that greater economic troubles lies ahead of them, and limited in how much cash that they can take out of their banks, Greeks have been using their debit cards to buy ovens, refrigerators, dishwashers, anything tangible that can hold its value in troubled times. A Greek jeweler, George Papalexis, said a customer had approached him on Wednesday, and this was the week of July 8th, wanting to buy a million euros, about $1.1 million worth of merchandise in jewelry. But Mr. Panalexis, the chief operating officer of Zoltalas Jewelry, said that he had refused the offer because he was more comfortable holding on to the jewels than having money in the Greek banks. I can't believe that there I was, he says, turning away a million dollar offer, he said. But I had to turn down the deal because it's a measure of risk that I'm taking. The reason being is that even though it was a million dollars in euros, what are you gonna do with a million dollars? You can't hide it under your mattress, right? You have to place it in the bank. And the banks are so really volatile, dangerous right now in Greece 
that, that, that he can't put the money in the banks because it might disappear overnight if, if the money is worth nothing. So he had to pass down a million dollar offer worth of jewels. And he said, man, I need to hold on to these jewels because the money might be useless or I can't hold on to that way. So he says, I can't believe that I passed on a million dollar deal. Well, this morning, we are going to be encouraged to rejoice in our trials and to live by faith and not trust in money because it will fade away so quickly. You know, we are living in troubled times. It's not just Greece because we can, oh, it's so far away that Greece is so far away, the things that they're experiencing. Oh, we're not going to have any problems here in America. But you very well know that the whole world is so globally connected together. The things that are happening in Asia will affect us, if not eventually will affect us here in America. And so as the world is experiencing these troubles and you look at the stock market going up and down, what James will have to say to us here this morning will speak just as loudly as it spoke to the Christians 2,000 years ago. So as we study the portion of scripture, I pray that you will be encouraged. I will be encouraged to rejoice in our trials, to live by faith, <coughs> and not to put our trust in money because it is going to fade away so very quickly. Well, let's begin by reading together in James chapter 1, verse 1. So will you follow along with me? If you don't have a Bible, scoot it to someone next to you. I know that they'll share with you this morning, okay? So James chapter 1, verse 1, it begins by saying this. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. Greetings. So here we begin by seeing that James introduces this book to us by introducing himself. James is the writer, but who is this James? Well, without getting into too deep of a detail because of our lack of time, this is James, the half-brother of Jesus. Now, what do you mean? I thought Jesus' brothers and his sisters, they didn't believe in him. They didn't. You might remember in the scriptures, it came to one point where Jesus' mother and brothers and sisters were coming to him. And someone said, oh, Jesus, your family is outside. And Jesus said, who is my mother and brothers and sisters? He said, you, those of you who do the will of the, of the Lord are my mother's brothers and sisters. Because his brothers and sisters and mother were coming because they thought he was going crazy. Jesus calling himself the Messiah. They didn't understand. Well, at a later time, James will come to know Jesus as his Savior, not just his brother, but as his Lord. And there's a lot of early history about this James. Now, again, this isn't the Bible here saying this, but this is tradition of, of, of what James was like. And tradition, early tradition of the church says that James, this James, was such a man of prayer that his knees had large thick calluses making him look like the knees of a camel. So tradition said that James was really, really a prayer warrior, always spending so much in time in prayer, and his knees were thick like calluses, like a camel's knees, because he was a man dedicated to prayer, just like Mario there in the back. Right, Mendoza? Okay. But not only that, very interesting, tradition tells us how he actually died. Well, again, tradition tells us that James was martyred in Jerusalem, that he was taken to the high pinnacle of the temple. Remember, Jesus was also tempted there, but they actually pushed James off. He fell to the bottom of the temple, but he didn't die. So his accusers, his persecutors came to the bottom and they began to beat him to death. And as he was dying, he cried out, Lord, forgive them. Very similar like Jesus said, they don't know what they're doing. Lord, forgive them for what they're doing to me. So James was truly a man of God. This is the James that we are reading here that has written uh, the book of James. And so he calls himself James, a bondservant of God, look here in verse 1, and the Lord Jesus Christ. So here James calls himself a bondservant. Well, interesting that James calls himself a servant of the Lord, but they often called James the just. 
because he was a very just man, he was an honest man, and they nicknamed him James the Just. But here James calls himself a bondservant of God. Well, the word bondservant means one who gives himself up wholly to another's will, and it is often used of the apostles who call themselves bondservants. Well, James says he's a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Very interesting. James was not only called, or Jesus was not only James' brother, but also Jesus was more importantly his Lord. Now think about this. James is writing this letter, and we're going to see to Christians, and he wants to address them. And because of the clout that he has behind his name, he could have began the letter by saying, James, the brother of Jesus, greetings to you. That would have held a lot more authority, right? It's like if somebody very famous is your friend or whatever, oh yeah, I know such and such, and oh, such and such, you know, when you use somebody's name, oh, that makes you oftentimes a lot more important. So James could have used his authority here. But isn't it interesting, he says, not the half-brother of Jesus, but he says, the bondservant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. So here we see a very humble man addressing the body of Christ, stating who he is. I'm just a servant of Jesus. I'm a bond slave. And I like what Pastor Chuck had to say about this portion. He said, a bond slave was just that. One who lived completely for his master. He had no rights of ownership, could not hold title to anything. Everything he had belonged to his master. He was there only to serve. So James begins his letter to us by stating that I am just a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter my authority behind me being a half-brother of Jesus. I'm just a servant of God. And it's the truth with all of us, every single one of us. We can't glory in any position and all that we have, but we need to understand that we're just humble servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we're humble servants of the Lord, he can use men and women who humble themselves in that way. Well, let's keep on here in verse 1. We see the recipients. Who was this letter written to? He says, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. James is writing here to the 12 tribes of Israel, the Jewish Christians, who are scattered abroad around the world, around the Gentile world. So James is not just writing to those who are in Jerusalem, but he's writing to the believers who are scattered all over the world, the Jewish believers. And then in verse 1, at the end of verse 1, he says, Greetings, which means that it may be well with you. May you thrive. James begins his letter with a blessing that they would succeed. And I pray that blessing upon you this morning, that you would succeed in the things that you do for the Lord, the things that you venture out in faith for God. And maybe someone's sitting there and you're thinking, wow, you know, I know that God wants me to step out in this, in this faith, this area, but I'm afraid. And I don't know if I could teach this Bible study. I don't know if I can open up my home for a home fellowship. I don't know if I can step out in this new job because I know it's going to give more opportunity for me to serve the Lord. Maybe less money, but more opportunities for Jesus. Man, may you thrive. May you be blessed. May you step out in faith for Jesus Christ and allow him to use you in a very powerful way. So I pray that this morning that is a word from the Lord for you. Well, James here in verses 2 through 8, he jumps right into the letter. And he explains what he wants to say to the believers as he wants to encourage them in the midst of their difficulties. Will you follow along with me in verses 2 through 8? Here we go, verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Verse 3. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, but let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. A wave of the sea. Verse 7. 
For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. Verse 8, he is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. James encourages us this morning to embrace our trials and to have faith. Here in verse 2, he begins by telling us to have joy in trials. That's right. James tells us this morning to have joy in your trials. How do you have joy in difficulty? I don't like difficulties. I like when the water is smooth. I like when things are just flowing and everything is going great on the 91 freeway, right? Or when you're just cruising down on 6th Street or you're going down Main Street and you're hitting all of the green lights. Isn't that nice? But then you come to the freeway right there and you go, what happened to Main Street off-ramp, right? It disappeared. We like it when things are going so smooth, don't we? But James here tells us this morning, as he jumps right into what he wants to tell the Christians who are scattered all over the world, he says this, he has joy, have joy in trials. Look at verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Now again, he speaks to brethren, which means fellow believers who are united together in affection, consulting a whole family, a single family. Man, it, it is wonderful. It is so blessed to come back to California and know I'm coming back to family. Not just my family, my sister and my brother, my brother's way up in Reading, but our family here, but also to you, just our brothers and sisters in Christ. We're a family. I can come back and I can experience the love and encouragement, the same love and encouragement that I have back in Okinawa. You know, what is so wonderful is many of you haven't experienced it, but some of you have who have visited. You have another family. You have a family in Okinawa, Okinawa, Japan. Japanese, they look a little different from you. Some of you look very similar. Uh, we have a wonderful family there. And you know, and they know I'm here. They're praying for me. And I know that you pray for me, right, when we're over there in Japan. And it's so wonderful because the family of God has just expanded. It really is. And I encourage you to experience your other part of the family, okay? So I want to encourage you to take a step of faith and pray about a missions trip and nudge your pastor to come back to Okinawa and come visit, and you come and join with us. Tickets are dropping. The yen rate is dropping. The dollar's worth more, so tickets are cheap. But we really have a family. And he begins by saying, brethren, all of us who are joined together, he says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. This word count it all joy means to consider it a thing, an occasion for joy. That's heavy duty. Count it all joy. What am I to consider an occasion for joy? When you fall into various trials. The word fall here is the word that means when you fall among robbers, when you are attacked, when you are jumped by the homeboys, right? That's what it's saying here. When you fall into various trials, which means all types of sorts of trouble, affliction, that has been sent by God in order to prove your faith, your character, and your holiness. Now this is important because on Wednesday night, we're going to talk about the difference between trials and temptations and how God brings trials, but he does not bring temptation, as James will stress to us on Wednesday night. So I, I want to I want you to come back because I want to stress that point to us as we understand here. But here James says, my brethren, he says, count it occasion for joy when you fall among trials, when you are jumped by robbers, when these trials are brought about in order for you to test your holiness, your faith, and your character. So we are told by James that when we go through all sorts of trouble, that these trials are sent by the Lord in order that we might grow in faith, in holiness, and character. So when I go through difficulties, the difficulties I go through are meant for me to draw closer to Jesus. How else am I going to learn unless I learn to, oh, excuse me, 
How else am I to grow in love unless I learn to love in difficult situations? How am I going to have more faith unless I go through difficult situations that cause me to have more faith? How am I going to have patience unless I am tested in difficulties that require me to be patient? You follow along with me? So you pray, Lord, give me patience. We've all done that. Lord, give me more patience. Give me more faith. And you know, the Lord isn't going to sprinkle, you know, fairy dust on you to give you more patience. All of a sudden you're like, whoo, thank you, Lord. I got more patience, you know. Or, oh, Lord, give me more love. And oh, thank you for that love dust that I have. Cool, groovy, awesome, right? No, the way you're going to get more faith, patience, love, and we can go on down the line is by going through difficult situations. And those difficult situations will cause you to grow closer in love with Jesus and growing in those situations. Look, right now, my biggest prayer, my biggest prayer for myself and my family is, Lord, give me more love. Lord, give me more love for you. Give me more love for your people. Because if I have more love for God and I have more love for God's people, I'm going to serve the Lord more. I'm going to serve God's people more. I'm going to do my best to be the best pastor I possibly can. So I'm going to do my best to teach God's people. I'm going to just love them in every area. It's just love flows out into everything. You know, I can pray, Lord, give me more a heart of a servant. Lord, help me to stay away from sin. But if I'm in love with God, I'm in love with people. I'm just going to serve more. I'm going to stay away from sin, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So when I pray for more love, what does God do? Does God give me that fairy love dust? No, not at all. But he's going to bring situations in my life that I'm going to be able to grow in love. And it's going to be difficult situations. So for me, situations will come up where I'll have to help somebody in the congregation with a situation that I really don't have time for. And I'm all like, oh, I don't have time. But okay, Lord, you brought this to my situation. So I need to serve them and love them more. Because as I grow, if I, as I, if I do this situation, I'm going to grow more in love. And my love's going to grow. And it's going to be difficult but I'm going to grow through that situation. So you might need more patience. Maybe you're an angry person and maybe you're dealing with your anger. Well, how are you going to overcome it? It's through going through situations that are going to test your anger. God brings these trials in our life in order for us to grow and to be strengthened. So when you're going through difficulties, James says, count it all joy. Look at it as an opportunity of an occasion to rejoice when you fall into various trials, when you go through difficult situations. And isn't it interesting that James does not say, tell us, if we go through trials, but he says, when we go through trials, because every single one of us as believers in Jesus Christ will experience difficulties in life. And it isn't like we have an angry God upstairs who's all like, whoa, how can I make Wally's life more difficult and cause him pain? No, it's a loving God that says, man, I am preparing you for heaven and all that I have in store for you. And even as the scriptures tell us, we're going to rule and reign in heaven. What does that mean? We're going to rule and reign. There's a, there's a job. We have a work to do. God has stuff for us to do in heaven. I don't know what that is, and no one knows exactly what that means to rule and reign with Christ. We don't know yet, but we're going to know. We're going to experience it. But life and everything that we're going through today, all the things that we experience in life is preparing us for eternal life, for what God has in store for us. We're just not going to float around in a cloud. That's boring to me. I don't want to sit and float on a cloud. Man, I want to be flying with the clouds, man. I want to visit this universe. And, you know, we're seeing pictures of Pluto. I want to experience that. I want to go to the ends of the universe, man. I want to be worshiping in heaven. I want to be surfing the huge waves in Mars. No, there's no waves in Mars. But anyway, you get my thoughts. God has things in store for us, and this life is a preparation for what he has in store in heaven. Because there is a, going to be, there is a job for us to do. God has things in store for us, and I want to be prepared and ready for all that he has, which is going to be wonderful and glorious, and words can't even comprehend as uh, Paul the Apostle has explained that to us in the scriptures. 
But listen, it's not if we're going to go through trials, but when we go through trials. God is going to use the difficulties that we go through in life here in order to prepare us for what he has in store for us. Because our character is being proven and strengthened. All that he has in store for us. Well, what does trials produce in our life? Well, in verse 3, it goes on to tell us here that trials produce patience. Let's read in verse 3. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Know this. Understand this. That the proving of your faith, which is the proving of your faith, which is the author of your faith, Jesus Christ, the testing of your faith will produce patience. Which means the characteristic of a man or woman who has unswerved from his deliberate purpose and loyalty to faith, even in the midst of giant trials and suffering. So what does that mean? Knowing that the testing of your faith is going to produce a patience in your life and a character like Jesus Christ. Now, this word doesn't describe just kind of like a passive waiting here, just kind of relaxing and it's going to produce this passive waiting. Like you would passively wait in a doctor's office waiting to see the doctor, right? Two hours, three hours, I'm waiting to see the doctor. But it's more of the patience endurance that a person has running a marathon race. There's a difference. You know, as we run this race of life, we need to have patience and endurance in it in order that we will succeed. And James encourages us here, no, telling us that this is what trials will do. It will produce this patience in you. It will prove your character. Trials, again, are not punishment for the Lord, but training ground for the believer to grow in Jesus, to grow in Christ. The difficulties that you go through and experience are areas that God wants you to grow in. And instead of despising trials, we can embrace them and understand that God is just growing me and causing me to, to become more like him. The Lord is going to carry you through those trials. He's going to get you through them. So let us learn through what God wants to teach us. Now, faith is tested through trials. It really is. God tests our faith through the difficulties that we go through. And God is going to cause us to grow in such a wonderful way through him. Now listen, faith is tested through trials, but not produced by trials. Trials reveal what faith we do have and to make our faith evident to ourselves and to those around us. So if trials do not produce faith, what does produce faith? Romans 10, 17 tells us. So when faith comes by hearing through the word of God, then our faith is built up in Christ. So our faith is tested through trials, but what produces faith? The word of God. The word of God produces faith. And boy, I cannot stress and overstress to you the importance of being in the word of God every single morning. You want your faith to grow you need to be in the word of God every morning, just spending time with Jesus, because that's all that matters. It doesn't matter if I have a meeting with the highest CEO of whatever company. It doesn't matter if I have a meeting with the president of the United States or the prime minister of Japan or whatever. Those meetings are not important as the meeting that you will have every morning with Jesus Christ. And Jesus never misses an appointment, but we miss the appointment. Jesus shows up right next to our bed, but oftentimes we're like, whoa, alarm clock, shower time, breakfast, 91 freeway, I'm gone, right? But the Lord graciously and patiently, the Holy Spirit just waits to meet with us in the morning. 15 minutes with Jesus, I tell people, and it'll change your life. Because 15 minutes with Jesus changed my life. My life is totally different now from spending time with Jesus in the morning and the peace of God that reigns in my heart what I don't deserve, but it all is because of just spending time with Jesus in his word in the morning. I can't encourage you enough to do that because as you read the word and you're spending time in the word, your faith is growing. And then through life, your faith is tested through the trials that you experience. And oftentimes we are running on empty through the trials of life is because our faith is so weak 
because we're not in the Word. Now, I don't know about you, but we eat, right, at least three times a day, sometimes five times a day. I'll eat three times a day and then two snacks at night. I mean, I got to have my snacks at night, right? right? I got my own peanut butter jar that no one touches at the house, okay, because they know peanut butter is a precious commodity in Japan. Anyway, but you know what? We eat all the time, but it's very sad that we oftentimes spent hardly any time in God's Word. And I can't stress enough encourage you to be reading the Word of God and allowing your faith to grow as we're uh, growing in Jesus through His Word. But then faith is tested through the trials that we experience. And James says, count it joy when you go through these times of testing because God is doing something through the times of testing in your life. Look at verse 4. <coughs> Excuse me. Let patience produce its good work in you. Let it produce its good work in you. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Let patience, let that unswerved loyalty to God have its finished work in you, that you may be perfect, which means that you may be brought to an end, finishing, wanting nothing, free, faultless from sin. This is pretty heavy. Let your unswerved loyalty to God have its perfect work in you. Again, that you'll be free from sin, inferior to nothing, when your trials, when your trials have their perfect work in you, you will be free from sin, lacking nothing. You will be made complete. Look, the trials of life, again, like I said, are preparing you for heaven. That God has something in store for you. We know in heaven it's going to be incredible. This life is preparing you for that heaven. And as you go through trials and difficulties, God is using all this to prepare you. And we're going to see this at the, end of the, at the end of the verses, that you are a very rich, wealthy person in Jesus Christ. But here, the word perfect here is the word that means to make you mature. When patience has its perfect work in you, you will be mature. You will be mature. You will find yourself not falling in the same sins that you've fallen into in the past. You know, as, as I'm older, man, already 51 years old, it is amazing on looking back in life, especially the last 30 years of my life. My teen years, I'm not worried about that. But the last 30 years of my life, I wish there were do-overs, right? That you could do it over again, certain things. Certain mistakes that I've made, the way I've just... Ah, maybe treated people or treated a pastoral situation. Man, I wish I can go back and just change it. As I've gotten older and matured, uh, hopefully I won't make those same mistakes I made in my younger years. But you know what? James tells us that as the word of God, as God is doing his perfect work in you through the trials that you're experiencing, you're maturing. So you're not going to fall in those things that you did in the past. As we mature, we shouldn't be following and just doing those same things that we did in the past. But we should be maturing and getting stronger. Those sins of the past that used to fall into so easily, as we're maturing in Jesus Christ, going through difficulties and trials, we're not going to be falling into those things anymore. And it's so important that James encourages us to be maturing in Jesus Christ. Through the trials that we experience, through the difficulties that we experience, we're going to be maturing in Christ. This is what happens through these trials as we grow in Jesus. Look at here in verse 5. If you lack wisdom, ask of God. If you lack wisdom, ask of God. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. James, you're talking to us about trials and growing in Jesus, and now you're talking about wisdom. How do these two things coincide? Well, very easily. James is telling us that specifically, as we go through trials and difficulties in life, oftentimes we don't understand why we're going through them. We don't understand the things that are happening in our life. And here James explains to us that we need to ask for wisdom. Wisdom through the situation. Even wisdom of why we're experiencing these things. Lord, what are you trying to show me through this situation? How do you want me to really handle this situation in life? 
When we go through trials, we're not just supposed to go through them endlessly, but we're supposed to learn through what God is trying to teach us. So when I go through areas of faith, because I want to grow in faith, I want to take new steps of faith. And there are times when I am tried in the area of faith and I've got to ask the Lord, Lord, what are you trying to show me through this situation? What do you want me to do through this situation? James says, when you are going through the difficulties of life, when you're experiencing these trials, if you lack wisdom, ask of God and he will give it to you. Look at here. Let's read verse five again. If any of you lack wisdom, which means that you don't have the understanding of knowledge of practical, godly, and upright living, especially in a situation that you're going through, let him ask of God, which means to ask God to release wisdom to you, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, which means liberally, which means to grant you openly and sincerely, Without reproach means to give it to you unbraidedly. And even more, this is such an interesting word, it means to receive it in your teeth and it will be given to you. This is very interesting because as I study this portion of scripture, it says, if any of you are lacking knowledge, wisdom for practical godly living, ask God and he will release his wisdom. He will give it openly to you, sincerely, frankly, into your mouth, it will be given to you if you ask. So, you're going through difficulties of life. You're going through trials of life. Situations are happening. Lord, what are you trying to show me? God, I need wisdom in my life. James says, ask of God, and he will give it to you liberally, right into your teeth. I thought about that, into your teeth. You know, uh, my mom was quite an amazing woman. And as you look back and some of the things you reflect upon your, your mom now that she's passed away now for about six months, you begin to think about some of the things she did and some of the funny things and some of the things like you try to reproduce. Like uh, me and Zach were talking. We're like, man, my mom's secret salsa is gone. Her hot sauce is gone. How, how are we going to replace that? You know, we're trying to, you know, my, my daughter's making it, Cindy's making it, but you don't want to offend them, and I, I know this is going to be on the recording, but you're still like, there's something missing that mom did. You know, like, you're like, what is it? It's gone, gone throughout history, right? I have to wait to heaven to eat it up there. I don't know. Where anyway, okay. Mom's amazing, and one thing that she's amazing with our kids is the way she would feed our kids, because she would feed them, you know, the little jar of squishy food from the, the, I don't know what that stuff was, right? They say it's peas and carrots, but you don't know what it is, right? But anyway, it was so amazing, because when I would feed the kids, and specifically thinking of Zach, when I used to feed him, you used to put it in his mouth, and he'd be eating, and then be coming out of his mouth, and then he'd touch it, like, no, don't touch that. And, you know, you have about 20 napkins all around you just trying to feed the kid, and it's going all over Am I alone on this? You guys just go, okay, all right. thought maybe I was just a bad dad or something. Anyway, my mom, when she used to feed the kids, it was amazing because she would get that jar and then she would get the big spoon, the monster spoon. She wouldn't use a little baby spoon. She'd get the, the one that barely fit in the jar. She'd cram it in there and I remember she'd get a big spoon and then she'd give it towards Zach and he'd open his mouth and she'd just shove the whole thing in his mouth. <laughs> Whoosh! And it would come out and immediately, you know, he bites down, it would start to come out. And then right there, because, you know, my mom's Japanese, so she's part ninja, okay? <laughs> she'd be like, you know, she'd be doing this, wiping the cheeks and, and shoving it back in. You know, serious. And it'd be like, he'd be just like, right? And she'd be doing that, the whole jar, and she'd be like, fast, the whole jar, just fast. Serious. And all of a sudden, next to she's scraping the bottom, and he's all, <laughs> right? And I'd be like, that is amazing, Mom, amazing. <laughs> Another one was diapers. This has nothing to do with it, but anyway, diapers. One wifey, one wifey, that's all she needed, okay? I'm serious, <laughs> serious. I remember me and Cisco when Asa was born, and, and we, an explosion happened. Cisco, get the wifeys, and he's all, we're nervous, and we're like 100 wifeys are gone, right? My mom was just like, it was awesome. <laughs> this is the word here that says that if you ask of God, he will give you the wisdom liberally. <laughs> He'll put it right into your mouth, right into your teeth. If you'll ask of the Lord. 
If you ask of God, he'll give you the wisdom that you need. But as we will see in the next verse, that oftentimes we ask, but we really don't believe that he'll show us. And James says, if you ask, if you need wisdom, lack wisdom, ask of God. He'll give it to you. Verse 6, look here. But ask in faith and don't doubt. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. Look, if you need wisdom of God, if you need wisdom in a situation, if you need wisdom for God to live in, ask of God and he will freely give it to you. But ask without doubting. Don't doubt because the one who doubts is like, uh, he's like the ocean driven and tossed by the wind. In, in Okinawa, we have, uh, you know, we have really a lot of windy days. And what's windy, I already know, oh, the surf might be blown out or something's going on. And sure enough, you go to the water, and it's really windy, and the waves are just kind of doing this and crashing on the shore. There's no form. There's no nothing. It's really not good for anything. It's just the windy seas just tossed to and fro. James says when, you're, when you ask of God wisdom and then, you, and then you, you don't ask in faith, you're like the wind, you're like the water, excuse me, that's just going back and forth and really good for nothing. Pastor Chuck again says this, a stormy sea, the waves seem to be rolling back and forth, tossed by the wind. So is the man or woman who doubts. You're tossed to and fro, lacking stability. James says, if you need wisdom from God, you ask. And when you ask, you don't, not, uh, you don't ask doubting because if you do, you're like the waves of the sea, just going back and forth. Look at verse 7 and 8. The doubter will not receive anything from the Lord because he is double-minded. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Let not that person expect, imagine to receive anything back from God because his mind is, un is wavering. He's unstable in his ways. So listen, it's like, it's like asking a person if they wanted to do something and then they say, you say, hey, you want to go out to dinner? And they, they say, sure. And then I'll send half an hour later, hey, where do you want to go out to dinner? Oh, I want to go here. And then, then I'll send, oh, no, no, half an hour later, oh, I want to go here. No, 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 how about we go back here? How about you do that? I mean, you, know, you know what it's like. You know, I know sometimes it's like that with me and Joanna. If either both ways, she's here, so i got to be nicer than first service. But, uh, you know, she'll ask me if I want to go somewhere, and I'll say, yeah, I want to go here. And then, then I'll change my mind and want to go here. Or, I don't want to go here. She says, well, where do you want to go, right? You can imagine first service, it was the other way around, okay? <laughs> but anyway, it's just unwavering. It's like you're just tossed to and fro. Don't expect that you're going to get anything back or anything from the Lord. Look, let not the man suppose that you receive anything from the Lord. If you ask doubting, James says, you're not going to receive anything from God. Understand that very clearly. But you need to ask in faith. You need to ask in faith. And when you ask in faith, God is going to show you what to do. And, and see, look, th this is why this has just changed my, my life, just reading the word. And, and I always tell you, every time I come here, I tell you how the word has changed my life because it really has. And I always tell you it has a lot to do with your pastor because Jerry challenged me over 12, 13, 14 years ago to read the word of God through the Bible in one year. Took the challenge and it changed my life. Awesome. But anyway, I'll read the word in the morning. I'll, I'll put a piece of paper next to me and I'll say, Lord, what do you want me to do today? And I'll just, you know, I don't hear out of voice. I want you to go to the store, you know. I'll just fill things in my heart. Oh, yeah, you know, hey, maybe email this person. And, da, 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 da. and I'll just say, Lord, do you want to say anything to me? And then whatever comes into my mind, you know, like usually the Lord will give me a thought and I'll just write it down. And then later in the day, I'll read it, and I'll be blown away. Oftentimes, I'll be very blown away. I'll go, wow, that, that's from the Lord, because I never would have wrote that down. And I, I use the example of, of a person who learns how to play the guitar and learn the guitar. I remember when I was teaching Ronnie how to play guitar. Can you believe that? I was teaching Ronnie. So his claim of fame when he's a famous, well, he's already famous. But anyway, you know what I mean. 
Tom taught me how to play those guitar chords. And Jerry's all, no, I did. Well, anyway, I remember six months later, I couldn't show Ronnie anything because he was already going like this, right? Well, it's the same thing with, you know, he trained his ear to learn how to play guitar. He trained his ear how to tune, you know? When you're hearing God's voice, you, you start learning. You can hear it clearer and clearer and clearer. And it doesn't happen overnight easily. It takes years. Just, and I barely feel like I'm barely tapping into hearing God's voice. But the Lord will show you what to do. He'll, he'll give you wisdom in situations. Lord, what do you want me to do through this situation? This is the situation I'm going through, this trial. And Lord, I could do this or I could do this. God, what do you want me to do? And the Lord will lead you and guide you if you will ask without doubting. And we have this mystical feeling about God. Listen, oftentimes we go through difficulties. We're like, I don't know what I'm going, why I'm going through this. It's, I'm just suffering for Jesus. Or I don't know, it's one of those mystical things that the Lord is trying to teach me. Then you float out of the room. You know what I mean? You're like, come on. You're going through these situations because God wants to teach you something. So what does he want to teach you? Well, maybe you're going through, now listen, maybe you're going through financial struggles because you're wasting your money and the Lord's trying to show you don't be a waster anymore because as you mature in Christ, you shouldn't be making those same mistakes you were making when you're 20 years old. Do you follow me? God wants to show you things. So when you are lacking wisdom in situations, ask of God and he will put it in your mouth. But listen, don't ask doubting because he who doubts will not receive anything from the Lord. James is telling us as believers, we need to receive from Jesus and ask him, and he will give you the wisdom that you need. It might not be the wisdom you want to hear, but it will be the wisdom that you need. He'll give it to you. God isn't some mystical guru who's going to like chase, make you chase all these rabbits before he explains to you what he wants for you. He's a loving God who loves you and is not going to tease you, but he cares for you and he wants to reveal his will to you. If you will only ask him, he will show you. That's what the word's telling. That's what the word says. If you ask, if you lack wisdom, ask God, he'll give it to you. He'll put it in your mouth, but just don't doubt. Trust in the Lord. He's going to show you and be willing to receive from him. And now James will tell us here, and he's not switching gears. I don't think so. In verses 9 through 11, he'll tell us to be content because riches will fade away fast. Now, wait, 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 James, you're talking about trials and trusting in God, and then all of a sudden you switch gears talking about riches. No, not at all. I think it's gearing for what he's telling us of what these Christians are experiencing, very similar to what we're experiencing today. The temptation to become rich, the temptation to seek after riches, the temptations and the difficulties that we go through when we, don't ha or we are lacking money. So James goes on in verses 9 through 11 as he speaks to the Christians there, as he speaks to us today, to be content because riches will fade away fast. Let's read verses 9 through 11 together. Let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation, but the rich in his humiliation, because as a flower of the field, uh, a flower of the field, he will pass away. Verse 11. For no sooner has the sun risen with the burning heat that it withers the grass, its flowers fall, and its beautiful appearance perishes. So the rich man will fade away in his pursuits. No doubt the early Christians during this writing were experiencing financial difficulties. Difficulties of things being taken away from them. Looking at the rich and seeing them succeed in life as they're struggling to get by. And James is saying, you're going through all these difficulties in order to prepare you for heaven. And the things I have in store for you. Because James says, understand, the riches of this world are going to fade away fast. And you are already a billionaire in Jesus. Look at verse 7. For let not, or excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, verse 9. For the, let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation. Here, the lowly brother, the brother in Christ, the Christian who is of low degree, which means who is poor. Let that poor Christian glory, take glory in his exaltation. And the word exaltation here in the Greek means his high rank, his high station in heaven. You might be poor in this world, but as a believer, you are filthy rich in heaven. You are highly exalted in position and exaltation in heaven. James says, 
let the lowly brother exalt in his, or excuse me, let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation. Listen, you Christians who are poor, he says, glory in your high level that you have in heaven, your glories, your riches, your high rank in heaven. Every one of us as believers are rich. You are the most wealthiest person on this world. Why do you say that, Tom? Because you have salvation. You know, a few years ago, we know that uh, 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 Steve Jobs passed away. One of the wealthiest mans uh, of our time, probably one of the most brilliant-minded man of our time, innovator, imaginary, the things that he did and was able to accomplish and get done that they're not doing today. You follow me? He was able to do those things. Incredible, his mind. But he died like everybody else. He died, breathed his last. He passed from this earth. He brought nothing into this world. And he, I guarantee you, took nothing with him. Nothing with him. And all the riches of his life, Every money, all his money, all the scientific knowledge, all of the greatest techniques of this world could not sustain his life. He died. He died like every other person is going to die. And I don't want to in any ways make it in light of him because it's sad any time a person passes away. But he died just like everyone else. But if he did not know Christ as his Savior and Lord, he is the most to be wretched. He is in eternal damnation right now. I don't know his life, so I can't judge him. But I'll tell you what, you have eternal life. And when you close your eyes for the last time in this world, you will inherit eternal life. And I guarantee you, Steve Jobs would have given every last thought, every dime, every innovative thought that he had in order to receive that eternal life. Grasp hold of that thought. And not only that, but you have riches awaiting you in heaven. And this is why I really like Wednesday as I'm inviting you to come back because here James will encourage us what is what, what's really important to help those who are the less fortunate of this world because when you do that, you're storing up treasures in heaven. And you know, the Greek buyout right now and there's all these people scrambling to spend their money and all this kind of stuff. And, and what's going to happen? You know, are they going to get an investment? I guarantee you all your good deeds and everything that you're doing is just raising investments in heaven. Just investments that you cannot even imagine what is going on in heaven right now. Now, I don't do good works. We're not a cult and we're not a religion that does good works in order to be saved and elevated in heaven. That's not why we're doing these things. But we do good works because it's a natural thing of our life. I don't, I don't do good works in order to be saved, but because I'm saved, as James will tell us, I will do good works naturally. And those good works that I'm doing are just being cha-ching, 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 stored up in heaven. And it's gaining interest. And God doesn't, you know, it doesn't deflate. God doesn't lose value. And all that's being stored up there. And James wants to remind the believers, you brothers who are poor and experiencing difficulties and trials, understand, exalt in or glory in your exaltation, in your high rank in heaven. He says here, but riches will fade away in verse 10. But the rich in their humiliation... Because as a flower of the field, he will pass away. The rich, those who abound in material possessions now, will be spiritually empty. And it will lead to lament and littleness and guilt in the coming age. Because all men are eternal. And listen, for those of you who are here who don't know Christ as your Savior and Lord, or you're in a backslidden state, understand very clearly that each and every one of us in this room, we are immortal. We are eternal beings. We're not everlasting. Jesus is everlasting. No beginning, no end. But we're eternal. Every one of us will live forever. You will either live forever in the presence of God or away from the presence of God in hell, eternal damnation that was prepared for the devil and his angels. You notice it didn't say the devil, his angels, and bad people. It was prepared for the devil and his angels. But people who decide to reject Christ, they send themselves there. They choose to be there. Will anybody be in heaven and not want to be there, but they're there? Will there be people in heaven who don't want to be there, 
Of course not. That's foolish. Just as foolish as what I was trying to say right now. I didn't make any sense. But you don't understand what I'm saying. <laughs> He's not putting him in, in heaven going, well, I don't even want to be here, but Jesus just made me be here, so I don't want to be here. No, no, you don't want to be there. You're not going to be there. Do you understand? But the opposite of life is death. The opposite of happiness is pain and sorrow. If you don't want Christ, then that's the alternative you have. Well, why can't I have a middle alternative? You, you can't. You choose God or you choose not. And the encouragement for you is to choose the Lord because he loves you and he has all this in store for you and prepared this for you. But man wants to choose his own way and he wants to do things his own way and it will lead to eternal damnation. Look at this. The riches of this world, they will fade away. The rich in his humiliation, in his spiritual emptiness because like a flower that fades away, that's so the same thing with a rich man. Just like a rose or a flower, it looks so beautiful for a time, but so quickly in a couple days, it's gone. That is what life is like. And for those of you who are young guys and you're like, yeah, I got all my life to live. You get to a guy like my age and you realize, wow, where did life go? Eternity is next and you need to be ready because riches will fade away just like a flower and life will fade away so quickly. So in verse 11, James says this, <coughs> Riches fade as you pursue them. For no so sooner has the sun risen with its burning heat than it withers the grass, its flower falls, and the beautiful appearance perishes. So the rich man will also fade away in his pursuits. As you pursue riches, as you pursue that lifestyle of the rich and famous and all these, it's going to fade away so quick. So quickly, so quickly, just so quickly, withers like the grass. And, and, you know, I think about the Okinawan sun. The Okinawan sun uh, is a lot harsher where I'm at, and I, and I think it just has to do with the climate and everything. You, know, you can't stand in the Okinawan sun very long, or you will experience some serious sunburn. It's really bad. But here I notice it feels like Southern California. It's hot, but I'm all like, ooh, what is it? Why is it? Maybe it's all the smog, huh? Maybe, huh? Ooh, scary. Anyway, come visit. Anyway, all right. But it's dangerous. And so just like the sun could just scorch the flowers and it just fades away, so will the rich person in his pursuits. He's just going to fade away. So you're going through trials. You're going through financial difficulties and situations. God is trying to teach you things. And the whole idea is not for you to strive after more riches and try to be rich because that's going to be empty. But learn through the things that God wants to teach you. Allow him to mature you. Allow him to do his work in your life. And as he does that, man, wonderful things are going to happen in your, in your life. God's going to do great things. Well, James goes on in verses 12 through 27. And it's really good. And again, one last time, I want to invite you. Come back on Wednesday. Let's study the word together and see what James has to say to us in that portion. But this morning, there's three things that I believe that God wants, to, wants you to take with you. Take with you from this place, because God wants to speak to us, and I know he's speaking to your heart. So would you also take these things with you as we're studying together? Three things that really the Lord wants to show us here and that we studied. Number one, learn through your trials. Learn through your trials. Your trials here are not to punish you, but to perfect you. Let me say that again. Your trials are here not to punish you, but to perfect you. Learn through your trials, number one. Let the Lord teach you, mature you through the difficulties that you're going through even right now. God is not punishing you, but perfecting you. Why am I going through these things? Well, I don't know, because it leads up to the second thing. If you need wisdom, you ask of God. The second thing here, ask for wisdom, not doubting. Come before the Lord and ask him, and don't doubt. Don't doubt. You know, it happens to me. You know, one of the things a pastor is we're preparing for messages. Those of you guys are teaching. I need illustrations. Lord, I need an illustration for this one thing. What? Lord, I need an illustration. Can you give me one? And I'll, then I'm all like, oh, let me, let me look here. Let me, look, oh, let me read the internet. Let me do this. And I'm all, oh, Lord, I'm sorry. Lord, is there something? You have an illustration? 95 percent of the time when I do that. The Lord gives me an illustration. 
you know, might shoot somebody at like David. And I'm like, oh, David. And like I'm thinking, oh, David. And then I'll, I'll look in the scriptures. And I'll go, thanks, Lord. That's so cool. Instead of beating around for an hour, it's like, Lord, thanks. You gave me that illustration. That's just one aspect for me. But are, do you need wisdom from the Lord? Number two, ask for wisdom, not doubting. Do you need direction in life? Ask God for wisdom and, he, and wisdom to live life in a practical, godly way. God will give you his wisdom. The Lord will give you that direction. But don't doubt. Because if you doubt, you're like a man or a woman, like the, like the ocean that's just tossed to and fro, James says, Right? And then thirdly, what's the third thing that we need to grasp hold of as we leave this place? Be content and don't chase after riches. Be content and don't chase after riches. You are already rich, okay? So next time you drive to the guy in the Maserati, just look at him, roll down your window and say, hey, I'm rich. (laughs) Yeah, as you're driving your Pinto. Are they still around, Pintos? Why'd that come into my mind, Pinto? Why not? Something else. Those of you who are old know what I'm talking about. The young kids are, what's a pinto? Pinto bean? No, no, it was like a pinto bean. Listen, you're rich already. Stop striving after that. Be content. You are rich. You have a high rank in heaven. You have a high rank in heaven. Because the wealth of this world will quickly fade like a flower in the middle of the Okinawan hot sun, right? So this morning, We can rejoice in our trials, live by faith, and don't trust in money because it fades away so quickly. Let's trust in Jesus and all that he has in store for us. Will you bow your heads in a word of prayer with me? Lord, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would continually just soak this message in their hearts, that we would grasp hold of this. And I know, Lord, there are some here who are going through heavy, heavy, heavy trials Lord, reveal to them as they ask in you what you're trying to teach them through this, what they need to do through this trial, how they need to grow through it. Holy Spirit, give them your wisdom in the midst of the things that they're going through. And Jesus, I pray for my brothers and sisters who, who, some who are striving after riches right now, they're striving after them. And I pray that they'll be encouraged this morning to stop striving after riches and to be content. You know, them having more money is not going to get them through their trials better. Lord, we need you. And may we trust in you and stop striving and just cling on to you. So, Lord, we thank you for this morning. And may you continue to grow us in Jesus. May we fall more in love with you. May you do your work in us. And we just thank you for today. And we pray all these things in the wonderful name of Jesus, our Savior and Lord. And we agree by saying... Amen. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed. Have a wonderful, wonderful day. If you need any prayer, uh, prayer requests or anything, I know their leaders and the pastors will be up here. Love to pray with you. God bless you. You're dismissed.